Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Thursday, May 2nd. We are here live. It's going to go quick. We've got an hour this morning. It's a free-for-all. Phone lines are open right now. Jump in and start dialing. Join me. I've got stuff I could talk about, but we've only got an hour, so get your questions in here quickly, and we will get to them. If you're on the app, hit the Call Now button. That'll get you right in here. If you're watching on the live stream, you can dial 855-950-3835. We'll get to those calls as soon as they start coming in today, so line them up. Uh, Following in the next hour will be Mike and Kevin Beckett with Rolling Toe. If you have questions about alignments, tires, handling, tire wear, tire pressures, vibrations in the drive line, all of those things, hold those for Rolling Toe coming up in the next hour. All right. Uh, while the calls are coming in, I'm just going to go through the uh, news I have been following this morning. Um, lots of reports of uh, carrier layoffs. So uh, here's a Florida carrier shuts down over the road and dedicated fleets, lays off 57 drivers. Um Raven Transport in Jacksonville laying off 83 total employees. Uh, We're seeing more of that, but then there are some other interesting numbers as always. I think I may have talked about, I don't know if I talked about this one yesterday or if I just posted this one after the show. Uh, 92-year-old Texas trucking company files for bankruptcy and liquidation. Arnold Transport transportation services i was going to say transport arnold transportation services has 30 341 trucks truck drivers 402 power units so obviously there's an issue uh too many trucks not enough drivers that's an awful lot of trucks just sitting without a driver in it but the interesting thing 92 years old um they made it through deregulation let me think, 92 years, that, what, that's uh, like 1930-something? Yeah, my math isn't, my brain isn't working yet this morning. Um, they started in the 1930s. So we're going back to my grandfather's time. I've talked about this, and, you know, the, the seat in the truck was a wooden bench. There were no interstates at all. Uh, My grandfather was contracted to a moving company and made trips to the West Coast uh, from the Midwest. I think at the time he was probably in the Detroit area. Um, You measured a trip to the West Coast in weeks, not hours, the way we do now. Uh, Different world. That company has been through all of those changes. Just incredible, but they can't make it through this dumpster fire of an economy we have right now. It's just, I've been talking about it. It's an odd economy. Some things, the numbers still look good. Um, Some things, not so much. Um, Three affiliated companies, Parker Global, Parker Transport, and DVP Holding also filed. Um, Those were affiliated companies with Arnold Transportation. this is a very, very well-known company. Uh, been around a long time. It's hard to say exactly why this one took them down. Um, some other statistics to go along with that. Hold on. I know I had. Um, okay. So uh, here's some other statistics around that. Here's the uh, the headline. Trucking's bloodbath. Did brokers or carriers take the biggest hit? Um, It's hard to say, and it's still not over, but it is pretty interesting that we have um, we have lost a lot of carriers. We continue to lose carriers, but we are still 90 some thousand carriers higher than we were before the pandemic. So 2019. Now, that has been four years ago. In four years, we would typically add about 23,000 carriers. That would be an average growth rate in four years, not 90 some, three times, almost four times higher. That is why rates are still depressed and it's harder to find freight right now. There are still um, 
too many companies. Um, just still too many carriers and too many trucks in the market right now. Uh, interestingly, C.H. Robinson finally had actually a strong first quarter. C.H. Robinson has been struggling. In fact, this is not a statistic you would want um, if you are a publicly traded company, but um, C.H. Robinson is one of the most heavily shorted stocks in the entire stock market. I'm not sure if it is the most shorted. I thought I'm one of the most heavily shorted shares in the market. Now, what happens then that can compound what's happening with C.H. Robinson right now. They had been doing so poorly for so long, people were shorting their stock. And what that means is investors buy the stock in a very specific way hoping the stock price goes down and they you can actually make money shorting a stock if it goes down uh, it's kind of an interesting process how it works but when that happens when a bunch of investors believe that a stock is going to go down and they start short selling it if they have a good quarter and robinson just did nobody expected it then what happens is all those short sellers panic and they need to get out of that position before the stock goes up more. So they start, you can't say they sell their stock, they cover their short position and that makes the stock price go up. Doesn't necessarily mean that it has anything to do with the overall economy or the overall market. Um, C.H. Robinson is a big enough company with a lot of moving parts and a lot of complicated stuff going on. And um, their good quarter really didn't have much to do with the market itself. It had a lot to do with internal um, changes they had made and some accounting things. But it, it was interesting to see overall. Um, it seems to me like the, the brokers have taken a bigger hit so far than the carriers. And the brokers can also take a bigger hit as the, the freight uh, prices go back up. So we will keep an eye on that. Um, here's something the ATA and OIDA actually agree on something. It doesn't happen very often, um, but they are both. Here's a bunch of initials. The ATA and OOIDA urges the EPA to consider the realities of trucking in the final emissions ruling. Um, this ruling seems really insane to me. And this ruling, I've talked about it, is not about emissions. It's not about the environment. It is about the push to electric vehicles. So it, if we're moving to electric vehicles, and we are whether we like it or not, um, it looks like the consumer is going to go kicking and screaming because the electric vehicles are not selling the way anybody thought they would. If we're going to make that change, or you're going to force us to make that change, then why would we invest all of this money into cleaning up diesel engines if they're not going to be around? They're really clean right now. So this isn't about making diesel engines cleaner. This is about that final push to get the OEMs to say, look, we're, we're, we're just going to move to electric. The problem with that is they can't. This, this ruling goes into effect in, um, well, what was this one? This, this one's fairly early. Uh, we only have a couple of years, depending on how the model years fall. There's only a couple of years. We're not, the, the, the OEMs would have to be really, really working hard right now on new technology for diesel engines. They don't know yet how they're going to do this. So you have to develop it. You have to test it. There's a lot that has to happen and we can't switch to electric in the next couple of years. We don't have the grid. We don't have the charging. We don't have lots of things that we need to make that work. We don't have electric trucks, really. Nothing that's proven itself at all yet. So it, it looks like this is uh, a squeeze that may cause a lot of problems. We will keep an eye on that and let you know. There are uh, already, so we'll talk about, uh, we've got elections coming up this year, obviously. Um, there is a group of 
GOP lawmakers, the Republicans, introducing a bill, a resolution to undo the EPA's emission standards. So the Republicans are against this. Unfortunately, the Democrats have enough power right now to push this through. But we have an election coming up and elections do matter. So keep that in mind. If you want to talk about that, we certainly can. Uh, I thought this was an interesting headline. Not that we don't know this. Uh, If you're in this industry that we've watched this shift happen. Um, The headline is people aren't into the life of trucking anymore. Companies say Um, the industry has changed a lot. Our society's changed. Our economy has changed. Uh, We've had a front row seat to watch this in trucking. And I've talked about it many, many times. Uh, I am the kind of the end of the baby boom. Um, I'm turning 61 today. Uh, I am the end of the baby boom. And you can see that effect in trucking. The largest group of drivers still in the industry are my peers, the people that got in within about a decade of when I got in. And a lot of them are starting to retire. They're getting to that age or they're, they're being forced out because of health issues is also very common in this industry. And I, I believe we're kind of the last generation that ended up in trucking a lot of times because of our background. I had a family background in trucking. I was just talking about my grandfather. I'm third generation. Lots of people grew up on farms. They were around equipment. We, we don't have many people growing up on farms anymore. We don't have a lot of people growing up turning wrenches anymore the way my generation did. I mean, that was our hobby. We, we, we built cars and motorcycles. We turned wrenches on things. And that's gone away for a lot of reasons. One, you don't really turn wrenches on vehicles anymore. I was just talking about this on Tuesday. Uh, when I was 16 and you had a car, you had to know how to work on it. Or you had to have a lot of money to pay somebody else to do it. But at 16, um, you couldn't afford to have somebody else change your spark plugs. That's something you used to have to do a lot and set the gap on the points and replace the distributor cap. And and I talked about U-joints and starters and alternators and fuel filters and carburetors and, and on and on and on. You worked on vehicles a lot. You don't anymore. So we, we've lost those skills in the market as well. Not that it's as necessary, because I, when I was talking about this, I was talking about the fact that trucks are, are starting to become the same way. In a lot of ways, trucks are already there. It, it was common, pretty common uh, at one point to carry a spare alternator around with you. They failed quite often, and it was a pretty easy fix. Replacing an alternator on the side of the road is not that big of a deal. Uh, It might save you a service call or a lot of downtime. That's not really necessary anymore. Uh, We used to replace starters a lot. I haven't heard of anybody telling me about a starter replacement in a long time. So uh, the industry has changed. The drivers are not the same. They are not looking at this as like a family tradition or or a lifestyle. This is, to them, it's a job. Um, And there's nothing wrong with that. Your, your job does not have to be a, a lifestyle, but it will change and, and already has changed a lot. So uh, there's a whole bunch of headlines that we could talk about. I think I covered most of what I was looking at this morning. So I will get to some phone calls. We've got about uh, 45 minutes for calls. Jump in and join us. You can hit that call now button on your app or if you're watching on the live stream, check the live stream. Yes, it's working. All right. You can call in 855-950-3835. We're going to start off in South Carolina. Terrence, good morning. What's up, Kev? Happy birthday, honey. Well, well, thank you. What's on your mind today? So this is funny that you were talking about you when you first started. So I got a couple of things. Well, back to fixing your own cars and stuff like that. My brother actually just sent me a picture of a, I had given, lent him a, a timing light. 
Oh, and, yeah. and, uh, I forgot about you know, timing lights. So That's it, right. It, it, it's funny as hell because I'm, I'm and I was wasn't joking. When I said it. I said I've been looking for that for years. I knew I had one, and I moved. You know, with when I was younger then, so I was yeah. either in an apartment or something. So I would put it something. You know, you moved around. And then once I got my own house, you know, I probably left. Get, so I, yeah, you take it. Right. But he found it. So he moved too, and I took a picture. So like, well, friends, we know. He, he said it was like that, that should be in a museum and stuff because I, you, didn't, you don't. I never hear of a time, time light or anything anymore. I, I forgot all about timing lights. So that was another <laughs> big deal when you did a tune-up. Uh, you know, I don't even know what you would call a tune-up on a car today. What What do you do on a tune-up? I mean, have, most of them, just there's just nothing to do. Um, but we used to have to do points, plugs, condensers, set the gap on the plug, set the gap on the points. And then you had to time everything with a timing light. You had to hook the light up to the spark plug wire. So we were trying to determine one, top, dead top dead center. <laughs> when was the piston at the top dead center of the stroke? And you had to get that all set right. And um, yeah, that and now that's all done in the ECM. I mean, that still is a thing, yep. but that timing is now all done in the ECM. That used to be a mechanical process. Um, the more I talk yep. about this, the more... It was a pretty big deal to do a, a, whatever we would call it, a tune-up or a service on a car. There was quite a bit of work. And you almost always, yeah. m- most of the time I remember, you would also change a fuel filter then. Yep, yep. There was an inline yep. fuel filter. We would change that as well. Uh, and this was, I know the oil change we would do every like 2,500 miles when I was young. When would we do the tune-up? Seemed like we did an awful lot of them. We must have done them pretty often. Yeah, but I can't remember when and it, when you would do that. And all depends on how what kind of motor you had too, because you had a motor that ran hot. You would burn up wires too, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, but then, so you know, then you then you then you contemplate getting the the, the XL, the big thick ones, and all that right. crap. But then you spend right. the, the, you know the money you would spend on that. It's like shit, I'll just you know buy you know a good set of wires, but. Well, and just all the different parts. On Tuesday, I was talking about U-joints. You know, U-joints used to to replace those a lot on cars and trucks. We we don't do it much on either one of those anymore. The other thing, and I talked about used to see these shops all over the place, and I I saw one the other day. It's the first one I've seen in a long time. An old-school muffler shop. Those used to be on every corner. Because you worked on your exhaust system a lot. They rusted out. Oh, and yeah. yeah, you were constantly under there um, putting a new muffler on or a new tailpipe or new piping. or, or It was just a constant thing. I, I swear you could, or buy, if you, didn't... <laughs> you could buy a car today and drive it to 100,000 miles, never open the hood. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, or used to the thing with the mufflers too is if you if you didn't get your timing right and you let off the gas and it backfired, you blew your muffler apart. So you don't need to play it. And then you got to, do, yep. Yeah, yep. that's right. Um, so as, I, I as far just, as the the other thing, oh, go ahead. That, well, I had another thought on something else we used to do a lot. What was it? Uh, now I just lost it. Uh, oh, I know. It, yeah, it so, was one of the jobs okay. that I absolutely hated. Um, it got better as I, you know, got all the specialty tools that made that job so much easier. I used to hate changing drum brake pads. Brakes. Brakes, yes. <laughs> I used to hate doing brakes. All the stupid little clips and springs and specialty parts. And if you ha- But like you said, if you had the right tools to it, take off that little disc thing you pushed on, if you yeah, had that, that was if, easy to get the, the pads off, I mean, right. the, the shoes off and... If you had the, the whole first, one, first time I ever did it. Uh, oh, gotcha. w- w- yeah. When you're in there with needle nose pliers and screwdrivers and, <laughs> and once you got the whole toolkit for doing brakes and you knew how, then you were like, oh, yeah, I could do brakes. Watch this. Zip, zip, zip. And you were done. But before that, I used to just yep. hated that job. Oh, and then the, the biggest thing, uh, the first time I ever did it was I put the brakes on, the shoes on wrong. I put the big <laughs> shoe in the front. <laughs> Boy, it's amazing how fast you can stop those tires when you do that. Yeah, yeah. D- disc brakes, huge, huge improvement in every way. Oh, yeah. 
Absolutely. So, what, like you were talking about, um, like you know, a lot of places are closed and stuff. But, um, you know, we hold, like I said, I'm dump trailer. So, but we they, we opened up another facility up in Florence with, with putting twenty twenty quad quad axles yeah. up there because they're, they're they're building they're doing ninety five. They're building this huge. We've been doing it for the last almost a year. This huge battery plant, Envision battery plant in Florence, and we're bringing most of the product in there. So we'll. It's a. I mean, again, it's a specialty niche, but yeah. I've gotten lucky over the years. When in the in the late in the late eighties, I had my own truck and I was working at, at at delivering appliances for merchants. Oh yeah. So that you know everybody had to have stuff. You know. Oh well, and I, I, I left that I, and I went. I'll also tell you that that was the height of kind of that high-end remodeling craze in the 80s. So merchants and, and yep. the stores that merchants delivered for um, was doing really well at that time. Yep, yep. I, that's how I got my, my first tractor because yeah. I, I, I bought a tractor to, 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 to supply the stores. Yeah. I had somebody run my straight job, and I drove the tractor. So I got lucky there. Then I moved, I, in, in 99, I went to stock hauling cars. Hauled cars for a great boom. And then it hit like 2007 when it took a crap. Yeah. All of a sudden, the the, the uh, auctions went up because nobody yeah, right. could buy shit. Everyone was buying used. Yeah, right. So we were. I was running all over the place That's hauling it. used stuff. I, I yeah. just got lucky. And then, like I said, then when the pandemic hit, I was in Wisconsin hauling beer for Miller. What did people do when they didn't go to work? They started they drinking. Yes, they did. <laughs> yes, yeah, they and did. Drinking, and did we you? and we were like bombed. Hey, Bond would work with that. You must be clairvoyant or something. I don't know. I don't know. Then I moved down here and started doing this, and I haven't. I mean, yeah. I haven't stopped. There was a couple of days when I first started where they said, "Oh, you know, you're on standby due to weather." But in construction, that's normal. You know what I mean? Well, but like, as far as I see, we we got work out the wazoo down here. Man. You know, here's one of the things I've said for years. We, as an industry, we like to brag about the fact that we're so important because without us, the rest of the industry would or the economy would shut down, um, which is true. But if the people who gave us fuel shut down, we wouldn't be able to work either. So um, every occupation is somewhat important. But I but I have said that just by the nature of what we do and that every other industry does need us. We're not going away. Somebody is always going to move the freight and somebody's going to make money doing it. Make rates, money doing it. Rates yep, can absolutely. never go so low that you can't make money doing this because then people would stop doing it and our whole economy would shut down. So rates can go down, but they can only go down to the point where it is still possible if you know how. That's why I teach the way I teach, learn how to run on minimal expenses because that's what you need to get through times like this. Um, it's just the only thing that, that I've had to change about that is the whole concept of autonomous vehicles. That, that could be the one thing, because I've always said, look, as long as you can drive a truck and you can keep yourself in just the top half of the industry, I, I've never seen anything so bad that we wiped out half of the logistics industry. So as long as you are, uh, yeah. are reasonably good and you can drive a truck or own a truck, you're always going to be fine. The only thing that will change that at some point, hopefully not anytime soon, will be autonomous vehicles. So downturns are rough, but we have lost entire economies sometimes, entire industries um, you know, what would happen yeah. if you owned a factory that made eight track tapes, maybe you switched to making cassettes, <laughs> but, but probably not, you know, entire industries have disappeared that, that can't happen with transportation. So, you know, it, it's got to get there. It, it's got the freight has to get there or our entire economy shuts down and then nothing matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, another thing, too, like what you were saying with the electric and all that, it's definitely going to come, but, you know, I mean, it's all over. They, they dove into this way too fast, and, and, and in my opinion with that, the way they pushed that through and all that, that was just him trying to get, get on board with all of you, the tree huggers. And, again, I'm a tree hugger, too. I love the environment. I don't shit on it. But what they're trying to do with that and cram it down our throat, we're not ready for it, man. When, there's no way we 
you could throw all these trucks out. That's why that you don't see very many of them. Only the big companies got them, and and they're basically testing them. You and, know what I mean? They're just testing them and seeing how it works. And, and let's it, be. It'll not, it, I shouldn't say never, but it, I don't think it can come that quick as they think that it's going to happen. Let's be real about the companies that are buying these trucks. This is virtue signaling. Those companies are right, not yeah. doing this because they think it's the right thing to do right now. No. Now, I get it. Those companies are big enough that they can afford to go out and do this. It's not a big deal for them. It will keep them kind of on the cutting edge of all this. But none of those big companies are getting prepared to replace all of their internal combustion engines. They're running small Absolutely tests not. here and there. Um, and that's mostly, like I said, just virtue signaling that that's so UPS can say, look how green we are. What's the same thing with the CNG and 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 uh, and the yeah, exactly. natural gas and the other one that right. they're using because they you know LNG because they, they put their name all over the place right. and then PepsiCo was another big one that did it so when they put it on the news and on every news that it was <laughs> exactly. on exactly you've seen a, a Frito Lay truck going down the road right. oh well you know with Doritos on the side <laughs> right exactly. That, that, and it's good business for them to do that, but then people believe that oh, that yeah. somehow we're making this big switch. We're not. We're not. Nobody no, no. is. Nobody is is buying into this. Well, some people are fooled, but I know I'm not. Yeah. All right, Kevin. I'll let someone else get in there, man. I will enjoy your birthday today, man. Thank you. Good talking to you. Uh, let's go to Florida. We've got lines open. Hit that call now button. We've got uh, about 30 minutes left to take calls. Coming up at the top of the hour, we'll be followed by Mike and Kevin Beckett and Rolling Toe. So line up all of your tire and alignment-related questions for them. If you've got any questions for me, anything goes today, by the way. We can talk about anything you want. Jump in. Hit that call now button or dial 855-950-3835. Matt, good morning. Happy birthday. Well, thank you. What's on your mind today? So, well, first, the whole timing light issue. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron's was talking about. Yeah. You know, if you were really good, you didn't need one of those. You okay. just kept <laughs> tweaking the distributor cap until, <laughs> until it sounded right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I, I don't I don't I don't need no damn feeler gauge to set my points. I can do it with a screwdriver. I can eyeball it. And it's a good thing there were no emission control systems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, See I, the, those sensors would have went out really fast. I, I kind of miss those days because honestly, you could all these things we talk about with with horsepower and timing and I you could do those with wrenches. Now you have to do all that stuff with computers, and I'm completely lost. I have no idea what they're doing in there anymore. Yep. Well, yeah, pretty much 7 sixteenths, half inch, 9 sixteenths. Yeah. And probably a three-quarter inch wrench. You could do 90% so, of the work. I, I have a question. Why? Yep. Why? Because you know the whole joke. I see it everywhere about everybody loses their 10-millimeter socket. <laughs> Why, why yeah. did we never say we lost our half-inch socket? That was probably the one you know. used the most, right? Half-inch, I would yep. say. But why, why the whole thing that everybody does about losing a 10-millimeter socket, but we never did that about a half-inch socket? Well, that, that just goes to show you the English system's better. <laughs> yeah, it keeps even, you, even it makes you, not, it, you understand it, math. it makes you think more. It, it makes you use your brain more. That's yep. about all we can say about it yep. is um, you, you, you have to it, it, think about it. you more engaged. That's right. Well, that's, that's why you don't lose the socket. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, so, uh, it, it, you're talking about. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, talking about C.H. Robinson and then, you know, brokers in general. And I wonder how many people swore at the radio. When you said it seems like brokers are getting hit worse right now than carriers or truckers or, you know, whatever yeah. you want to word it, it owner operators, because uh, it sure doesn't feel that way to. No, I get you know, it. To the average owner operator. I know. You, you know me, though. I try to tell people you should not be running your business on emotions, and that's just an emotional response. I, I can tell you this I've been around both yep. sides of, of this industry, carriers and brokers, I've done both. 
Uh, I work with both quite often, and I can promise you, if I had to pick right now to be a small carrier or a small broker, hands down, I'd rather be a carrier. I have way more options to stay in business. So I uh, just renewed my contract with my direct shipper, and I don't give uh, this information out of my exact rate because yep, right. coming out of Florida, right. it's uh, I got to protect it somewhat. I don't <laughs> yeah. don't like uh, talking direct numbers, but I'll talk it's, overall numbers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just let's see if you can even come up with a wild ass guess. Okay. If you were to bid a regular route, year long contract, a load every single week coming out of Florida, and the lowest number I heard was going to California. I don't remember how many drops were on it, but or exactly where it ended up, but. What was the lowest number you would possibly go per mile? <sighs> okay, and knowing... No, there is a fuel surcharge. So are we quoting an all-in rate or separate fuel surcharge? Uh, well, you can do it either way. I can okay. do the math of what the fuel so surcharge was. But. Just giving my logic of why I would be willing to go to these kinds of numbers... Um, Knowing the freight market, freight going into Florida is usually above average because the freight coming out of Florida tends to be below average. So if you understand that market, then you know I can give up something coming out because I can do better going in. I would be in the dollar eighty range somewhere. Yeah. So I understand, you know, Florida. And bidding stuff low coming out of Florida, going to Atlanta, the Carolinas. Oh, absolutely. As as yeah. Texas. Right. The shorter the but haul coming out of going, Florida, the, the, the yeah. more that matters. Yeah, but when you're going all the way to the West Coast, I, I can't comprehend bidding so low. And this is... Oh, I thought we were talking about you. Brokers, for everything. you back and forth to Minnesota. No, no. Oh. No. Well, I, I can give you some of those numbers too, but yeah, I, this I is just the cheapest one I heard. Yeah, in California. Uh, uh, unless I had really good dedicated freight going from California to Florida, and that's not a really strong lane. So yeah, you'd have to be careful no. with that. You could get yourself in a lot of trouble bidding this one. So the bid was a dollar nine one Ooh. zero nine. Ooh. Now there, the fuel surcharge. So we bid three weeks ago. Fuel surcharge three weeks ago was forty four cents a mile. That is so still awful. Right. A mile. Yeah, that's that was to I the west coast. Just, yeah. Oh. I mean, oh. I understand it. One week when there's nothing to do. But right. Year long but, contract. Well, right, that's, and and uh, uh, that's a long, long way to take that rate. Yep. Oof, man, that's that's yeah, that's, that's kind of scary. The cheapest one, and now none, they didn't even consider any of these bids. Yeah. I think the cheapest one on my lane was a dollar twenty-six a mile. Oof. Say, all the all the bottom barrels, they didn't even look at those bids. Good. And you know relationships. Yes. When they came back with they, what they told me they would accept, or the 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 dollar amount they were going to accept between me and the next one which I was way, way above this. <laughs> um, and they said, they'll, they'll give me five cents more than that other bid if I would come down to that. Okay. So I did. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was a 26% reduction from what I'm still hauling for for the rest of this month. Yeah. Starting in June. Uh, isn't that? It's a cut. Uh, yeah. You know, that's one of the things that, that you, you have to be prepared to deal with when you do dedicated freight. And that's hard to swallow. It's hard to say, okay, I'll do the exact same thing for 26% less. Well, but that's just the how the market works is, though. Not, yeah. I mean, the reality of it is that brought me back to my 2018 rate. <laughs> Which I remember was oh. still really good. Yeah. Yeah. And this is only, you know, half of my freight. This is. Right. Well, and. Southbound freight hasn't dropped at all. Which is really nice. And if we think about it, 
I've talked about the charts, and if we took out the COVID years, the chart is right where you would expect it to be following up from around 2018. And that's exactly what you negotiated. Yep. So it's, like you say, it, it was a gut punch at first, <laughs> but, you know, the yeah. longer you have yeah. the numbers. And, yeah. And, and, and so my thoughts of, of buying a truck just got pushed way out. <laughs> well, right. This year. Yeah. Which, well, I'm building the house, so it ain't going to happen this year no matter what because of yeah, that, other reasons. But. That, that's that's way too much to take on all at once. But, um, yeah, that's that's uh, it, it is hard to go backwards. But then we can also look at, at how strong your profit has been for so many years now. Yep. And I guess another good news side of it for me is my route is changing so i'm gonna have more drops and some more miles so i'm going to be running every other week yeah next I, month. I was gonna say you you so can't add me. any any more miles to than what you used to do no. so something has to give <laughs> yeah so being home more other than the fact that you know the last couple of years because the way i've been running i'm I'm kind of lazy when I'm at home. Cause just you, well, you have out. to be. Yeah. Out. You have to be. Yep. And uh, so hopefully maintenance-wise, I can drive some numbers down too. Right. Even though prices on stuff are up, but I can start doing more of my own maintenance again and, yeah. you know, save some money there. So it'll, it'll balance out, but it's, it, if for brokers or carriers out here bidding freight, it, it's, it is a bloodbath and. You know, I just thought about something on the the maintenance side of things. Um, I've got, uh, uh, I got, I actually got a couple tractors with that property I bought. I got a, a very cool 1971 Ford farm tractor, and I got a um, pretty nice John Deere mower, um, the D130 42 inch cut mower. Um, and I decided, since I don't know when it's been worked on, that I would just do a tune up uh, and. The, the tune-up kit has spark plugs and a fuel filter and an air filter and all the bunch of other stuff. And I'm going to rebuild the mower deck. But I just got thinking, the parts are all coming in today. I was going to head over there after, uh, uh, do I have anything this afternoon? No, I think I can go right after the, no, today's uh, Thursday. I have coaching, coaching today. Yeah, I have coaching. So I was going to head over there after coaching, but I just thought of something. How am I going to set the gap on the spark plugs? Well, new spark plugs, you just. Put them in. I was wondering, can Nobody I just... Nobody does that anymore. I, I was wondering, do, do they just... Is it just kind of a set gap these days and you just put them in? I haven't had a set of feeler gauges in about 30 years. Yeah, I don't... I mean, if you know what you're doing, but for the most part, yeah, that's... When you were talking do, maintenance on a car, that's... I mean... Well, and wires I, are really I, the only thing, and, and those are 100,000 miles on I, well, equipment. I, I, I'm trying to remember... I have 140,000 on my FJ, which is low for an 07, but, you know, we, it's kind of a spare vehicle. Um, yeah. I've never replaced anything on that vehicle myself. Nothing. Nothing ever breaks. It has had so little work done in that 140,000 miles. It's crazy. I don't know that I've ever had them replace the plugs or wires. I don't think well, I have. Probably not, unless it's I, I, running. I, oh, no, it's no, running bad. Nobody it, does it, any of that. It runs fantastic. That's what I mean. I haven't put a spark plug in an engine in decades. I, I was just thinking about this, and, and then I thought, well, wait a minute. When you put a spark plug in, you got to set the gap. And then I thought, maybe maybe you don't anymore. I don't know. No, I don't know anybody with with brand new. They just just take throw them, them the in and put them in. All right. I guess I could eyeball it, and, and if it looks close, I'll throw it in there. Huh. Yeah. Crazy. Do uh, you have more call? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. All right. We will talk to you again soon. Let's go to Oklahoma. Paul, welcome. Howdy. Hey. You, you're talking about what? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, you're, talking, you're talking about old cars and points and everything, and because I thought of that the other day. It's like, oh, you need a timing light. Yeah, I forgot so, about the I timing know. light. I was thinking about feeler gauges. Yeah, and then the smart people, they used to put whiteout on the TDC line so you uh, could see it easier. Chalk. I use yeah. chalk. Yeah. Right. Well, you used to use whiteout, yeah. 
Yeah, I used so, to because it because um, it was actually like engraved into the metal, and you could take a yeah, slot there. Yeah, yeah, I used to have those yeah. those big fat chalk like sidewalk chalk almost, and you would actually like fill in the gap with the chalk and then wipe off the rest, and you got this nice sharp line that you could see better. But I guess whiteout would work yeah, too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you, you you probably had sidewalk chalk because you probably paid a hopscotch in your lunch break. Well, you no, see, book. see, I grew up out in the country. We didn't even have sidewalks, so why would we have sidewalk chalk? Uh, on the yeah. 101 users. <laughs> yeah. So one of those Ford dealers I was at on Saturday, and um, he was talking about the electric cars. He said, I got like 11 electric vehicles out there. Yeah. Some of them have got huge rebates on them, seven and a half, ten thousand dollars off. He said people don't even come in to look at them or test drive them. No. Nope. He said they're not even and this is this is in Texas, um, Nederland, just down the road from Beaumont. So they're oil field yeah, that's right. workforce basically. Yeah. And he said the people don't even come in to look at them. And they got hey. an F one fifty lightning sitting right in front of the showroom. He said, people don't even look at it as they walk. It, 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 it was a horrible failure um, when it came to this. You know, for a while, when we talked about electric cars, you were really talking about Tesla, um, maybe a Chevy Volt, um, a Nissan Leaf. There, there had been a couple electric cars that had been around for a couple of years. But then all of a sudden, everybody rolled out five different electric models all at once. And I thought to myself, what are they doing? This is so stupid. These, these companies have never put a single electric vehicle on the road, and they're going to roll out five brand new models all at once? That, that's just ignorant. And we see what a horrible failure it's been. Hey, here's something interesting. Uh, back in the 70s, when the Japanese cars first really started showing up here in the U.S., Honda, um, Toyota, Datsun, which is now Nissan. Yeah. First off, the cars were absolute junk, but they were cheap. That that was how yeah, the kind of like a Hyundai and a Kia. It, yeah, it's, it, it, it's how the Japanese broke into the market. They just sold smaller, really cheap cars that that the uh, U.S. automakers couldn't yeah. really compete with the price. And then as they gained market share, they just worked year after year to make their cars better. And now Toyota and Honda went from being the, the total junk to some of the most sought after cars in the world now. And th those two yep. models are, are always way up there. But there was a big deal in the 70s, if you remember this. That if you draw, if you worked at GM or Ford or Chrysler, and you pulled into the parking lot and parked one of those Japanese cars, it might not be there when you came back out. That was a that was a thing. I just wonder now what would happen at these oil companies if you pull in with an electric vehicle and park it. You know, if you work at a refinery, I don't think you should be showing up with an electric car. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you go past any automotive manufacturing plant, whether it's American or Japanese or Korean, there'll be all sorts of vehicles parked out there. That, you know, the, you got the Ford pickup trucks and the Dodge Ram. They'll be the employees of Kia and Hyundai and Nissan and Honda. They drive those, but well, here's, you'll see plenty of Toyotas employees that work at GM pull up on a Toyota. Here's the interesting thing. I don't know how this works anymore. I used to know this all the time because people, well, maybe it's because I grew up in, in, you know, the auto world, uh, Ohio, Detroit. I mean, that whole area, I mean, car building and making was a big deal. And, and if you were in trucking, you were yeah. probably moving car parts at some point. But I remember, um, I, my friends would always talk about their parents who worked at Ford or GM or wherever got really big discounts on vehicles. Does that still go on? Yeah. Do the employees still get, like, you, significant yeah, you, discounts? You, yeah, you, you, you can still get employee discounts. Like, uh, even though I I'll, work I'll for a transport company, I can probably get some sort of discount if I wanted to go and buy a new car, but I'm not interested. In, yeah, I don't, I've got I, a, I don't hear anybody. I've got an F-250 that... Yeah, but you can probably still get discounts. Yeah, I wonder like if that. they're as strong as they because used to be. associated with... 
because my thought was, if you work at Ford, you should probably be driving a Ford not just to support the company you work for, but because you get them so cheap. I mean, that that used to be a pretty big thing. So um, the only reason you would think of buying a vehicle other than the company you worked for would be if they just didn't make a certain model that you needed. Uh, But but that was a that was a pretty big thing for a long time. Yeah. So starter motors and alternators and stuff like that on trucks. Yeah. My truck, my trucks on one million three hundred twenty four thousand roughly. I'm only on the second starter motor, and that's only been on there since about a million and fifty, I think. And then I'm on the third alternator, and that went on last year. So stuff lasts a lot longer than it used to. Well, so here's oh, something. It, it's interesting. I, I yeah. was just reading a comment somebody posted, and, and Jeremy said, I want to know where these trucks are that don't need work done. My 16 Freightliner, um, I replaced alternator, starter, water pump, belt tensioner, and idle pulleys at 784,000 miles. Uh, all of those things are interconnected other than the starter. Uh, so the, the alternator, the belts, the tensioners, the idlers, pulleys, maybe that was yeah. just not built well. That's not common. I, I really don't see those components being replaced. Um, certainly nowhere near as often as we used to, but some of these components make it the li- our, our life of the truck, 1.2, 1.3 million miles. Um, I very ve- seldom ever replaced clutches either. Um, and this Pittsburgh Power replaced my idler and tensioner when they did the rebuild. I still got the original idler and tensioner. I'm not sure if they replaced it. They might, probably know, not. But. Probably not. That's what I mean. It's not unusual to have those yeah. components be original after a million miles. Yeah, and 1.2 million miles out of my disc pads on my drive axles. So. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. <laughs> the, uh, the mechanic said, he said, next time you need a brake job, you're probably going to need rotors. And I said, next time <laughs> just, it needs a brake job, it'll belong to somebody else. It, it just, so, but then yeah. I... I, I I have had to replace two of the rotors. One a, a calib, caliber hung up or something, and the rotor got hot. So you just buy a rotor hub assembly. Right. Thirteen hundred dollars, I think it was roughly. And then I had to replace a front hub and rotor assembly. It's he he said it's quicker and easier, and probably more cost effective to just buy the whole thing rather than oh you just need a rotor because he said. It, there's a lot of little screws or bolts yeah. that hold that rotor on. Yeah. And he said the chances of you getting them all undone without, oh, you got eight hours of labor to undo 20 screws or whatever. Well, no, so, here's how that would work. They're going to break it. Here's how that would work. If there's 20 screws, you would have 15 minutes of labor for 19 screws and seven hours and 45 minutes for the one, one. you can't get out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but. The the replacing the reason I replaced that front hub is because it had, I had a little bit of bearing where you couldn't I couldn't see it on the bearing but you could you you could catch it with a fingernail you yeah could feel it and then when he showed me in the hub he says you could see what he said if you're gonna sell this truck this week he said stick it back on he said but uh, you're gonna keep it for a little bit and he says you might as well do it now while we've got it pulled down because it, re- it was a wheel seal that was leaking oh yeah but it turned into a hub and rotor so yep. uh, all right i think i'm still ahead so I'll all right go. bye gotta cut you loose um oh wait a minute what just happened oh i had two calls that had been there for a while and uh one of them just dropped off uh looks like there's one in the queue and it looks like i've got a little time to uh to grab that one um sean in california i know you had been there a while i was just coming to your call when you dropped out your question was uh my opinion about getting into the industry um if you can get back i probably won't get to it because i've got another call being screened right now um you could certainly call back tomorrow um, i'll give you my opinion i have pretty strong opinions about that topic right now specifically uh I believe I'll have Joel and Henry with me tomorrow. They'll probably have some uh, some interesting points about that as well. So let's uh, let's go to West Virginia. Randy, welcome to the program. Kevin. Yes. Tuesday, you and uh, the Pittsburgh Power guys was talking about uh, stuff you couldn't figure how they exist, like a muffler shop. 
Yeah, right. And uh, I just, for the day, I just put new muffers on my Jeep, and I put new muffers on my pickup truck, and uh, it's it, it, it act like a mattress. There's mattress places everywhere. I bought a new mattress from my house, and it was so nice. I bought a matching set for my truck, and I just put a U joint in my pickup truck. Well, we figured out so the mystery. You're I, keeping I all of so these. Funny. Yeah, we well, we figured it out. You're keeping all of these places in business. Evidently, and you know what? I go to that muffler shop. I had to wait because there was like three or four people ahead of me. So I, I, I go I, get my. That, yeah, I find that interesting. Well, here's the other thing I think of. We don't replace mufflers, tailpipes, exhaust the way we used to. You, sure, if, if there are people out there that are keeping older vehicles and at some point you're going to have to replace it, I, I, I get that it still happens. My thought was there are enough of these um, shops around like uh, uh, tire shops, trying to Les Schwab that, that would do a muffler. But to me, to, to see a place that is a muffler shop, like that's all that looked like this place did. They probably do other work, if you ask. But it, it looked like they just do exhaust systems. And there used to be a lot of places around like that. I, I'm surprised that they're just left. If that's all you're doing and you say this one finds enough work that they're busy. Oh, yeah, they're... <laughs> There's two within a mile of each other, and they both stay busy. I, I honestly can't remember. I, I don't think I have replaced an, an exhaust part on any vehicle. Now, trucks I have, uh, but personal vehicles, cars, SUVs, things like that. I, I do not think I have replaced an exhaust part since I've been out of the military. Like, I remember doing an exhaust just, uh, on one of my cars while I was still in the military, um, and doing it myself out in the parking lot, which was pretty common. But I, I don't think I've replaced an exhaust part on a vehicle since then. It was just so ironic. I was listening to y'all. Yeah. Like, I just had a muffler put on. Yeah. I just bought two mattresses. Yeah, well, there you I go. I just had a U joint put in. I just had brakes put on. <laughs> you, and I just had shocks you, put on. You covered it all. <laughs> that was so funny. Yeah. Interesting. I just want you to know, we really enjoy, I really enjoy your show, buddy. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, all right. It, uh, I was trying to make sure I cleared the board and got out of here in time. We've got a couple minutes left if somebody wanted to jump in. Um, you could certainly do that. Um, Mike and Kevin Beckett will be here any minute. We are just going to continue on with this show. They'll just, uh, they'll just jump into the studio here and replace me, and I will go get ready for uh, group coaching. If you uh, are considering the group coaching, Here's what I can tell you. Give it a shot. It's $75 a month. For $75, you're, if you do, just do it one month, you're going to get four coaching calls. You do a coaching call every week. And you can, honestly, you can ask me just about anything. If it's something that I can't help you with, I will just say I can't help you with it. But I, I have got some projects where I'm helping people uh, – buy real estate or look at the possibility of building a terminal. Um, I've talked a lot about the, the small carrier uh, family company I'm working with. Um, our last update on that was, was pretty incredible. Some of you probably heard that. Um, this is a company that could not get drivers. And in their segment and uh, what part of the country they're in and the freight they pull, I checked with other carriers. It was the same way. They were paying really well. It didn't matter. They couldn't even get people to respond to ads. The last update was they now have 15 drivers on a waiting list. That, that's a pretty incredible turnaround in a couple of months. Um, so if there's anything you want to work on, business, health, personal finance, real estate, uh, investing, retirement, whatever it might be, your social security, uh, the group coaching is a really, really good way to do that and not just get a, a, a quick answer like I might have to do here on this show. Uh, I will work with you as, as uh, long as you want to stay in the program or until we solve the problem. Let's, uh, let's go to Illinois. I've got time to squeeze a call in here. Brandy, good morning. Good morning, Kevin. I was listening to Canada Calling on Sirius, and they were talking about a new railroad strike in Canada and she seemed to be sure that it was going to happen. Most people are on board in 20 days. 
So okay. Just reporting news that you can look up and share. Got it. it did they? Did they mention anything about how much of an impact they thought it would have on truck freight? All I know is that because I remember the Union Pacific one. Remember how scary that was, and and Joanne was saying that ninety percent of the people seemed to be on board of, with the strike. So I don't know. Okay, but I'll take a look. I a lot of that to stuff share going it on. With you, yeah. you were, so you could look it up and spread it more. I will do that. That's all. Oh, all right. That was easy. Thanks for the call. All right. Um, the Beckett should be here any minute, so I really don't want to take another call and get uh, get tied up on one. Oh, I, I will also tell you, not only is group coaching open, group coaching is, I can't say it would be open forever all the time. It's We have to manage the number of people we have in the group coaching because I, I commit to each person in there that they will get enough time that we will solve their problem. So if that starts to grow too big at some point, we would have to limit it. The good news is people can move in and out of that program anytime they want. So you can join for a month, drop out for three months, come back for a month if you want. Um, so far, we haven't had an issue um, with time or too many people. So that program is still open. The CMC, um, we do still have slots in the CMC. Um as far as we can tell, we will leave CMC registration open for now. Um, as long as we feel like we've got space, the same thing in there. I have to make sure that I don't have so many people that I can't get to individual questions. We don't do a lot of Q and a in the CMC. The CMC is more, um, it's probably 95% me presenting and teaching and 5% Q and a. The coaching program is the opposite. It's, it's really 100% Q&A. Now, obviously, when I'm answering questions, I can be teaching a lot of things. We have a lot of people in the group coaching program that are only there to listen. They've told me that. They're, they're only there because they like what they learn, um, listening to me work with other people and troubleshoot and problem solve. Um, but that's really why those two programs together now are so powerful. Uh, you will learn a lot in the CMC because I spend a lot of time teaching, teaching tactics, teaching strategies um, it, with just enough time for you to ask enough questions to clarify what I'm teaching. The group coaching is the opposite. I, I'm not teaching anything. I am taking calls and, and problem solving with people. So when you put those two together, uh, it is as close as you're ever going to get to having me as your business partner. Uh, that's how, how in-depth we would be able to work. And, and I'm already doing it with people that are in both programs. Uh, for example, the, the small family fleet I'm working with um, in the Midwest. Um, Dale is in both programs, CMC and the group coaching. So I'm working with him quite a bit. Yeah, and honestly, it, it really feels to me like when I'm working with Dale that I, I own a small trucking company again. I mean, that's kind of the way I've been thinking, and it's the way I do think about that kind of a situation. How do I solve the problems he's having? Well, how would I solve them for myself if I were in that situation again? If I needed drivers and had a small um, trucking company, how would I approach that? So for me, this is, uh, I'm really enjoying this setup um, now that we've got the CMC underway and we have the group coaching. It really allows me to spend um, as much time as possible in my two strengths. Remember that. that now, that's something I'm, I'm actually working on. Uh, in the CMC right now, we're working on the standout assessment with people, helping them understand what their strengths are and how they build a business based on those strengths and how they spend as much time as possible working in those strengths. Uh, so that's that's part of what I'm doing right now in the CMC. All right. So the Becketts have just rolled into the studio so I am going to welcome them in and hand this off to them. Remember, this is a call-in talk show. 
We do depend on callers to call in and ask us things. Maybe we should get a res. I'm going to, I'm going to ask Mike and Kevin if we should do this. Um, when I bring them in, I have an idea. Not that we really need it. Sometimes I have to ask for calls. And then once I let people know we need calls, the phone lines usually fill up pretty quickly. Uh, if you have questions about tires, alignment, uh, handling, wheel bearing adjustment, tire wear, tire quality, and of course their favorite calls of all, anything to do with vibrations. If you have a vibration of any kind, just call them up. They, they love that stuff. Let's, uh, let's welcome those guys in right now. Kevin and Mike, good morning. You are morning. now my, my hated enemy. <laughs> Come on. You know you love those calls. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, and by the way, happy hey, birthday. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Another lap around the sun. That's right. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so, so, so just, I, I, I've, I've got an easy answer for you on the vibration calls. Sit back, listen okay. to them, nod your head, make those noises once in a while. Mm-hmm. Yep, got it. And as soon as they're done, go, oh, that's engine. Call Bruce. Call Bruce. <laughs> yeah, just, just that, that's the yeah. engine. I'm sure of it. Just call Bruce. What does Bruce think about us referring those all to him? <laughs> well, I tell him, just sit back, listen to their calls and complaints about their vibrations. And when they're all done, say, that's driveline. Call Mike and Kevin. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> You guys are just mean. And, and, and then I sit here and think, well, this gives me job security. I just keep yes, telling right. these two groups yeah, to call the other calling. one. Yeah. Just yeah. keep calling. Okay. All right. So what, what was that your idea that you had that you just mentioned to the listeners before you queued us in? No, I actually think I had. Oh, I know what it was. There are some times where people. Uh, I, I, here's my here's my opinion on why this happens. Sometimes at the beginning of the show, I just don't get any calls. Other times the yeah. phone lines light right up, and then sometimes you just don't get any calls. My explanation is that what I am talking about at my open is so engrossing and interesting that nobody wants to miss any of it so they don't dial yet. Does that sound That's right? That's an egotistical point of view. <laughs> well, I, I think it's right, though. But here's what I thought well, of. It's the truth. <laughs> here's what I thought of. Okay. Maybe, maybe for those times where they're just not calling yet, we should develop our own AI bot that will call us and ask us random questions in different voices. Random. Well, they don't even have to be random. You can schedule True. what the AI That's bot right. wants to talk about. That's right. And, we, and have a theme. We Not only could we have a theme... We could stack the deck so the AI bot always asks us those questions that make us look like total geniuses. Of course. You know, we'll, we'll have... Answering the questions nobody else... That's right. We'll, we'll have right. the questions from the bots be things like, well, I've already been to 27 alignment shops and I've spent $32,000 and I still have a vibration and then we solve it. Right. Just That's what we should one do. Phrase. That's right. Yeah, it, you won't have a vibration if you don't start the engine. <laughs> there you go. That's right. <laughs> what noise? Just turn up the radio. It'll go. Yeah, that noise you're right. hearing will go away. I promise. Yeah. yeah. I only get the vibration at 55 miles an hour. Don't drive 55. <laughs> drive above, drive below, but don't drive 55. People call me all the time and go, my fuel mileage sucks today. I've got a 30 mile an hour headwind. And I'm like, that's easy. Just turn around and go the other way. Go the other way. It's all Jeez, good. Yeah. Now you got right. now you got a thirty mile an hour tailwind. What are you complaining about? Okay, let me let me give you one that happened. I think yesterday. Okay. And this is a nice guy, but I'm going to pick him anyway. He calls me up and he says, "He says I had my truck aligned a year ago. The tires were wearing fine. Now I've lost the outside shoulder of the right front tire. It's a 1999 Peterbilt." I said, "Okay." I said, "No feathered wear. No feathered wear." How does the truck drive? Drives great. You just lost the outside shoulder, the right front tire. Yes. Okay. Have you checked the wheel bearings and the kingpins? Well, they're okay now, but about a, two weeks ago, I had to replace the right front spindle because the spindle got worn and the bearings got loose on the spindle. And I had to put a new one in there. <laughs> I said, do you think that might have wiped out your tire? <laughs> think. The response well, was, now. oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that, Kevin, did you happen to share with Mike the pictures I sent you? 
Uh, yeah, I did. Well, I don't know that I shared them with him. Uh, I didn't I see no right stain up. pictures. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so some pictures. Share, share those, Mike. Uh, Let me tell you the story while while he's getting you the pictures. So I get a call okay. from Nigel. Nigel's one of our longtime yeah. tribe members. Yeah, and Nigel yeah. sends me these pictures, and I see that he's in the queue, and he wants to talk about the pictures, and I see the pictures. So it might have been Tuesday. I don't remember what show it was, but shows like, you know, the, the Power Hour. Sometimes I can sit around for 20 minutes and not say anything. And, and this yep, was one of yep. those times. So I'm, I'm, I thought, well, I'm going to look at these pictures while I've got time. And we're looking at the pictures, and I'm like, what is going on here? Why? I'm not sure why, what I'm looking at, but I know it's bad. So what mm-hmm. I was, well, you'll see it when you, I, I'm looking at this tractor, got, got pictures from a couple different angles, and I'm looking at mm-hmm. it, and I'm going, well, the drive tires on the right side of that axle look like they're new. And the drive tires mm-hmm. on the left, what is going on? One is completely bald. I mean, not yep, one yep. single line of tread left anywhere, and the one next to it yep. isn't far behind. Then it dawns right. on me, why does that axle look so goofy? And then I start looking <laughs> at the other pictures, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Something is really wrong here. So now I, I get it. Okay, now this axle's so out of alignment that it just ate up mm-hmm. these tires on the left side, and, and we're going to replace those tires and fix this axle. But that's not what the story mm-hmm. was story was this tractor was backing under a trailer you can see it there um and getting mm-hmm. ready to go out on the road they just mm. the tire shop just replaced those right two tires but they and couldn't afford, do anything with the other side they couldn't afford the other side the right side was <laughs> worse the right side was in shreds <laughs> now I, there's so many things wrong with this story i don't even know where to start mm-hmm. Th- that mm-hmm. is just awful but- Yes, but yeah, we but, see it all the time. Oh, oh. We don't see it all the time. <laughs> Fortunately, as we train people, they, they, yeah. they fix these problems before they get to us. Yes. Just, just we keep one, trying to train people. Just one factor here. Like I said, there's so many things you could talk about, so many things wrong in this story. But just one is, why are we spending all this money? Oh, and by the way, the, the tires that were on that axle... Two, mm-hmm. weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. That that axle had four new tires on it two weeks prior. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. my question is, we could have fixed the axle a whole lot cheaper. Just fix the damn axle. Right. right, right. By the same token, in all the years I've been doing this, it's amazing the amount of times I run into fleets, big, small, or owner operators, who don't have time to fix their truck, so they just keep throwing tires on it. You're kidding right. me. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, oh. oh no. It happens what? all the time. You have uh, an inventory of tires, you, uh, and you don't understand what the problem is, so you just how that, spend money on tires. I guess that, uh, on a fleet level, that prob- but, but uh, owner-operators doing it is, is sinful. Um, fleets mm-hmm. doing it is just more fleet stupidity, and we see it all the time. But they, let's, let's look at it from the owner-operator's point of view. He's been to four shops. Nobody could well, fix the truck. Well, you're right. Yeah. Screw it. I'm just going to put tires in. I'm going to find the cheapest tires I can to put them on there because that's the you're, only thing I can do. You're, now, now that makes more sense when you explain it like that. I, I, mm-hmm. I, and, and that is, we've talked about how frustrating that's been for years, and that's why you guys do this show. Mm-hmm. We're so, back to the eighty twenty rule. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I've heard you say many times that there's nothing a stick of dynamite won't fix. So, yeah, or a half a stick in the fuel tank. Right. <laughs> it, it, I, it, okay. I tend to be a little more subtle. My solution to those kind of problems is just leave it in the hood with the door open and the engine running and, and walk away, and that problem will be fixed. <laughs> Some, <laughs> somehow, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, real yeah. quick. All right. All right. Good. So you having a good birthday? Is it my birthday? That's what I saw on Facebook. I, I thought I heard a couple people say that it was my birthday, so I guess it is. So far, it's just like every other you day. Don't, you don't know when your birthday is? You know, I guess I probably know. Sometimes I have to really stop and think about how old I am. <laughs> That's, yeah, the birthday is okay. It's right. I usually don't forget that. The year sometimes yeah, I can't get right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I I don't care about the years. I just want the presents, and I know which day I get them. Well, there you go. There you yeah. go. All right, you guys ready for a good show today? We're good, we buddy. Are. All right. I will uh, I will get one. out of your way. Phone lines are open. Hit that call now button on your app or dial 855-950-3835. You guys have a great show. Be safe. Be profitable. Be fit and healthy. Always do the hard work and master the journey.